You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. Take off that mask and take on your addiction. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, and the host of The Alan Charles Show, is here to bring hope to the hopeless as he shares his unbelievable luck at surviving a 24 year drug addiction. Alan's raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. So now, please welcome the host of The Alan Charles Show, Alan Charles. He's given us the real story, The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Alan Charles Show. Coming to you live from a rainy and humid New York City. 82 degrees here at 9.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome to my show. I'm your host, Alan Charles. And for those of you that are new to my show, we're here. We talk about addiction, recovery, and reality. We pull the mask off and we go behind that mask and we talk about addiction and what really goes on. And we're here to shine a light. We're shining a light on the stigma of addiction. This is a no stigma zone. And it's important that I say that because I grew up and I'm sure a lot of you out there have grown up where people that are Addicts, whether you're an alcoholic, a drug addict, sex addict, gambling addiction, you name it, whatever the addiction, you're looked at and you've been frowned at. Nobody wants to be known as an addict or an alcoholic. That's not how I grew up thinking that that was going to be my label. But unfortunately, you have to be able to reach a bottom and ask for help in order to get better. And sometimes, which I think was part of my problem and I stayed out as long as I did because I didn't understand that you had to give up and that wasn't a sign of weakness. It was actually a sign of strength to give up and to ask for help. So unfortunately for me, it took me a lot longer to get here and to get in and to get better You don't have to go through that, and I'm here to tell you about that, and that's why I am here. Today, we're going to talk about the bonuses of getting better, the rewards of recovery, all the good things that can happen to you, the most important being you get your life back, and could you put a value on that? Can you put a price on having this life that you get destroyed because of an addiction, an illness. It's something that you end up losing all control with and you can get better. There are ways to get better. There's not just one way. I happen to believe in a program of recovery because I have seen that work for literally hundreds of thousands of people. Me personally, I've probably seen thousands of people get better, but I have been told that there are hundreds of of thousands of people that have gotten better with this program. So if it works, why fix 
a wheel that's not broken. So I do what was suggested. I don't work the program perfectly, but fortunately, the part that I happen to do really well is I don't pick up at all. And that is the most important thing. And I am here to help you, and I'm so glad that you're here. So tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the rewards of recovery. But first, let's talk a little bit of what's going on in the news. Uh, The first addiction-related article that I happened to run by today that I thought was pretty incredible. I don't know if this will uh, go through, but the FDA is making a new push for graphic warning labels on cigarettes. Now, if you go and Google FDA makes push for graphic warning labels or you know something like that, I'm sure it'll come up pretty easy. But you can see there they've uh, come up with 13 new warning labels that would that would have to appear on cigarettes. And some of the images are just plain out shocking, disgusting, scary. And I don't know if it's a good thing. I guess, you know, to me, these are cancer sticks. So, you know, I'm I don't smoke at all. And I am it scares me. It disgusts me, actually. But these warning signs that they intend to put on, there's one image of a cancerous neck tumor. Uh, There's another picture of a diseased lung. And then there are feet with amputated toes. Mm, Could you be pushing the uh, the. package a little too far maybe but uh you know what that's what these things are doing they're killing people and uh it's a deadly product but people have a right to smoke it um and do what they want i don't know you know i've always been against the secondhand smoke but but whatever's going to happen if they happen to get those on there are going to be less smokers so uh i don't know if i'd start selling some of my tobacco stock but, uh, but uh, you know, take a look out there. It's pretty interesting. We'll keep an eye on it, and we'll, uh, we'll see if that gets passed. And then the other thing that I wanted to talk to everybody about was Matthew Perry. And Matthew Perry, of course, of Friends fame, uh, had a major in-the-media problem with uh, opiates and alcohol and um, you know being a, a famous actor and celebrity going through addiction in the public eye can be embarrassing it could be shameful it could be downright uncomfortable and uh, those that face it and walk out the other side those are the people that uh, end up we talk about we follow Uh, We want to celebrate. So, you know, we are celebrating Matthew Perry's 50th birthday. And more importantly, Matthew's been sober since 2001. So uh, he's been pretty outspoken about his recovery and, uh, you know, and all the different things and struggles in his life. So one of the things, here's a quote from People magazine. Uh, I had a big problem with alcohol and pills and I couldn't stop. Everything. Eventually, things got so bad that I couldn't hide it, and then everybody knew. The interesting reason that I can be so helpful to people now is that I screwed up so often. It's nice for people to see that somebody who once struggled in their life is not struggling anymore. You know, that uh, can't be said any better than that. That is wonderful, and uh, more power to Matthew and you know, there were a couple of other things that uh, I, I happened to look at. Let's see. Uh, a couple other quotes that he shared. I really lived life to its fullest, and that got me into trouble from time to time. So, you know, kind of a, a quaint uh, little uh, tidbit from Matthew. And uh, this is the one that I'll – this will be the last one that I'll share with you. And, and it's pretty strong, and, you know, it's very important – You can't have a drug problem for 30 years and then expect to have it solved in 28 days. Getting sober is a really hard thing to do. But if you can do it and you stay with us after this break, we'll all talk about rewards of recovery. When we come back, you're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. 
French Rastafarian baker Chef Oug Mat is a fourth generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Sheikh Ouvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. Before we went to break, I gave you a little introduction to our show tonight. We we're going to be talking about the rewards of recovery. Um, if you would like to share on what recovery was for you and some of the rewards or, or even send me in a little testimonial of how sobriety and recovery has worked for you, two ways to get a hold of us. You can call me at 866-451-1451. And as my regular listeners know, they can email me with questions, and the email address is alan, A-L-A-N, at theallancharlesshow.com. So send in your questions. We'll take a handful of questions tonight. If you want to call in and talk, let's talk a little bit about recovery and the rewards of recovery. So, you know, I, I've got to be honest with you, and this recovery and a program of recovery you know I had mentioned that a little earlier that that's what I worked on and believed in and grasped on because I had no more hope left I was about to lose everything I was in and out of recovery centers inpatient I was in and out of uh, short-term outpatient facilities. I, I think I attended 16 of those over the term of my addiction. I just could not get it. I was so addicted to cocaine. Everything that I felt in my body, whether it, I had all my pleasure senses, everything was all geared around cocaine. My brain chemistry changed. My life was an absolute nightmare, and I don't wish it on my worst enemy. So that's why I'm here to help you. And most of the shows, we talk about tough stu- tough subjects, and we'll have some fun. But tonight, let's let's cheer up. Let's talk about rewards of recovery. Uh, as I shared on some of my social media postings, you know, for me, I lost everything over a 24 year period. And that included two different marriages. My second marriage, I had a couple of children. I tested positive in court and uh, wasn't able to talk or see to my children for months and months. Uh, 
money, jobs, uh, my ego, my I, – I just felt – there was no ego. I, maybe I had an ego and thought I was something, but there was nothing left. Everything crumbled. There was no money. There was no car, and I ended up homeless. I mean I lost everything. And so recovery, the rewards of recovery, do you really get your life back? And I am here – as a testimonial that not only do you get your life back, but you get it back in spades. If somebody promised you coming back that if you recover, if you can arrest your addiction, no matter how you can do it, whether you can do it with self-will, whether you go to a recovery program, whether there's a doctor and you get medication to come off whatever you're addicted to, no matter what, if you can stop and be sober and then start to repair your life. You give it some time and things start to change. But what I was going to say was, if you start recovery, and let's say you get into this and you're a month or two sober, and you're starting to, your head is starting to clear up, and somebody says to you, you know what? After 10 years of sobriety, write down a list of all the things that you would like to get back in your life. And, you know, you might say, I want to I wanna be able to, to pay my bills and to be comfortable and I want to get relationships back and I want to have some meaning in my life and all these different things. And if you make a list for 95% of the people, if you made that list and that was what you signed up for and that's what God gave you, well, then you are selling yourself short. It happens and I see it all the time, the wonders and the rewards of turning your life around. And not only do you get your life back, you get your self-respect back. You get your esteem back. You can now look people in the eye again. You can walk around with your head high and your shoulders back and you can carry yourself in a different way because I know how an addict carries himself and what goes on underneath and it's not pretty and you would not want to feel like somebody that was going through an addiction because you don't have real good thoughts about yourself. You look at yourself negatively. So we will talk about the rewards. Um, For me, my enjoyment growing up, even though I had some trouble and problems in, in my house, in a very dysfunctional house. My love was baseball. That was my first love. And I loved playing it. I fell in love with the Yankees. I had a passion to watch it. Um, so that was something that meant the most the most to me. That uh, It was ingrained in my thought process. It probably was an escape for me. Um, I would listen to the Yankee games every night on radio while I went to sleep. I mean, I ate, slept, read the paper, got up, radio, whatever I needed to do, it was always about baseball. Um, I did pretty well in school. That, that came pretty easy for me. I was fortunate. And then harness racing came into play. I started going to Yonkers Race way so uh in high school in yonkers raceway there's a couple of different types of horse racing there's thoroughbred racing where you ride the horse on the back those are jockeys and then there are drivers that you are driving the horse in a race bike or a sulky and that's behind the horse and i was very fortunate the passions to two things that i had passions for i ended up pursuing And I played professional baseball. I played uh, professionally in the Dominican Republic. And then I had a career as a professional harness racing driver and trainer. Uh, So my life was pretty exciting. But because of my addiction, the baseball wasn't affected, but harness racing was. And that was right at the onset of my addiction, and it became progressive as I started to lose everything. But we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue talking about the rewards of recovery. I'll give you some stuff from the 
big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then I'll also give you some personal stuff, and we'll tell you a story about winning a race early on in my recovery. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the veteran's folk style wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit, whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and I am your host, Alan Charles, and I'm really glad that you're here with me tonight. We've got a rainy night in New York City, but we're talking about the rewards of recovery, and even if it's raining, that brightens everything up. So we're going to talk about, and I will share some of my rewards, but I will talk about rewards in general. But what I want to say, and I don't want to backtrack and mix this up, because there are so many different places that we can go into talking about rewards and what you do to get the rewards and what it takes to do this program or to find recovery, because this is not easy. And, and I shared with that that. A little earlier. So recovery, my first year of getting better, it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I don't I can't sugarcoat it, but you know what? You're going to have to, if you're a male, female, you're going to have to pull up your big boy pants or your big girl panties and you're going to have to suck it up and you're going to have to ask for help and you're going to have to put up that white flag because that is the only way that I know of that you can really get better. So once that's all set in a place, the recovery piece is the foremost important thing. But as you start the process, here the rewards are instantaneous. You start to get a clear head. That the all of the going through recovery and coming down off your using, and now as you spend your first few days in recovery, you, you feel crap, you're coming off, you're detoxing. So now the rewards of recovery you start to feel better. Now you're still going to feel the urges. And those are going to be with you for a while, which is why people, you know, people say, why do you have to go to recovery? And that's one of the most important things is, is because it jump starts, you're getting better. It takes that first 28 to 30 days, and that's usually not enough. 60 days or 90 days, if you can afford to do that and you have the time, well, actually you should make the time because you're, you're playing with life or death. But during that time, you start to get better, but there are plenty of triggers and things that you're going through. So you want to stay on this path where you're listening and you're taking suggestions. You don't even have to like what you're doing, but you know what? If you want to save your life, you're going to listen and you're going to do this as best as you can. And you can just keep trying because there is nothing wrong with doing whatever you have to do to get better. There's no wrong reason to do that. So now as you start to build recovery, you cannot rush it. You have to take your time. And 
other people, just because you're better doesn't mean that other people are going to forgive you. It doesn't mean that you're going to get certain relationships back. It doesn't mean that you're going to get that job or that high paying job or get money back. You have no idea what's going to happen. But if you concentrate on getting your life back and taking care of yourself and doing these things, you will get the rewards of recovery. So It took me a while. I couldn't see my daughters. It was months and months. Um, Fortunately, my ex-wife did not follow through um, on the judge stating that I couldn't see my kids for six months without weekly tests. Um, I had to get weekly clean drug tests, and it had to be for six straight months And then I would be able to see my kids. Now, I did do that. And actually, the divorce was finalized during, I guess, a couple of months into when I was ordered by the judge to do that. So there was really nothing else that I had to report for. But my therapist at the time suggested that I go ahead, document it, pay for the weekly test, because then I could show my ex and everybody else, if I am ever questioned, that I am now clean six months and I went for weekly tests. And I did do that. But probably after the divorce was finalized, mom, my ex let me supervised with her she let me see my daughters uh so she was good about some of the stuff and so but my point is it took a lot of time and there was a lot of anger a lot of mistrust and it took me probably three years until the first time that my ex-wife Stacy allowed me to have my daughters Jordan and Samantha spend an overnight with me and I felt so much joy. My sponsor, Peter, would tell me how proud he was of me. I was just, it it was pure exhilaration. It was a moment that I felt finally for one of the first times in my life that I really accomplished something and that now I have my daughters back in my life and, you know, they were now we're about to, I went on a voyage with them where they were able to teach me unconditional love. I didn't know unconditional love before that, but that was another gift for me. Um, on some of the social media posts um, I shared today to promote the show, I talked about this past weekend. My favorite singer, who I've been, I've talked about it on this show from time to time, and who I've been teased my entire life because I'm a male and I love Barry Manilow. And Secretly, I think a lot of males do, but they get teased about it, and it didn't bother me growing up. But I ended up exposing both my daughters and sharing Barry with them. And my older one, Sammy, has taken to Barry, and that is her favorite singer. And I had the pleasure of sitting in the fifth row on Broadway with my daughter, watching Barry perform. And then I asked her, do you want to see Barry? Should we go out to the stage door and wait for him? And she wanted to. And, um, you know, my, my daughter, my daughter has special needs and I've talked to about my daughter, Samantha. She's incredible. Um, she has autism. She's on the spectrum. Fortunately, one of the things that my ex-wife did do incredible was we had early intervention. So because we started early and got ABA therapy and all the other wonderful things that they have out there. My daughter is wild, so I got to enjoy this concert and this time with my daughter and her enjoying Barry and insisting that we wait an hour outside until Barry comes. So those are just some of the joys. We'll share some more. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like 
I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host to Winning Back Your Life from Addiction every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And before we went to break, we were sharing about some of the rewards of recovery. I talked about going to a concert this past weekend on Broadway with my daughter, Samantha, and just having an incredible time. And these, those, when I was going through my addiction and my children were little, these are thoughts I never dreamed of. Um, taking my daughters to their first Yankee game was exhilarating. I've had so many. I've taken my daughters away to Florida. That was another big thing of being allowed to actually take my daughters out of state and uh, take them on a vacation. So it takes time, and that's one of the things that you have to remember. There is no timetable. For some people, things you get certain things back quicker than others. Some people, things just come back slowly. You never know what in life your lot is going to be, but under it all, you just have to, you have to have faith. You have to believe your life. You can't be more miserable in life than somebody that has an addiction and has this illness and sickness and has no motivation because their brain is being controlled by drugs, alcohol, or whatever the addiction may be. So the recovery is long and hard. And you, we hear people, they wish you a short and a long, not a short, wishing you a long and steady recovery. And what that means is, is there's no rush. You take your time, live life, enjoy it, learn how to be in the moment. And those are all gifts of recovery because you don't want to sell yourself short. You just, there are so many catchphrases, do the next right thing, live life one day at a time. And as hokey as I still think some of that stuff sounds, if you think about it and you read it, they all have incredible meaning and if you have an addiction or in recovery you can relate to these things so take it slow go one step at a time now the next thing that i want to do is share a story it's kind of a a cool story in my estimation um 
but uh, and we'll try to give you the short version. But this story appears in my book, Walking Out the Other Side, an Addict's Journey from Loneliness to Life. Uh, I haven't promoted my book in a while, but if you Google Walking Out the Other Side, uh, my book is available on all online bookstores. The website's walkingoutheotherside.com, and you'll see links for that and also ways to get a hold of me. I speak all over the country. If you need somebody to come in and talk at a high school, college, your business, do a lunch and learn. I've done a lot of those and God, those have been so successful. And I, I, I love to go out and help people fight addiction and recovery. So let me tell you about this. One of these rewards that came to me and it took time. Now, I've shared, you may know if you're a regular listener, that uh, I've had a pretty interesting career. I played professional baseball in the Dominican Republic, and I also was a professional harness racing driver. And I love driving racehorses. I grew up going to a racetrack in Yonkers, New York, called Yonkers Raceway. And I would go with friends and a family to watch the horses race. And I just got so into it. And it wasn't because of the betting. I ended up watching the strategy and maybe it was because I knew the behind the scenes thing. I, I got to meet some drivers and trainers and I'd go to watch my friend's horse, friends of the family's horse train. And I, I really got myself involved and it was something that I threw myself into. Probably early on became an addiction because everything that I've done is um, I guess I have that addictive personality. I think we've tempered it down a bit, but um, I do have a lot of passion, as hopefully you see here. And so I ended up, to make a long story short, after some ups and downs in life, uh, I came back from playing baseball, started my professional life, uh, worked for Motorola Communications, then went up to Danbury, Connecticut, and worked for a rock station up there, I-95 FM, the leader of rock and roll in the state of Connecticut and Upper Westchester County, and uh, had some fun there, but then I got that idea in my head that I wanted to drive racehorses. So I was about 27, 28 when I embarked and had to go through a whole process and um, of driving and training. I had to train horses. I had to learn. I got jobs working at farms in different places up and down the East Coast. Uh, I ended up in Brandywine, Delaware, Pocomoke, Maryland. And after going through a bunch of different procedures and getting my trainer's license and my kind of rookie driver's license, I ended up in 1989 at a track called the Meadows in western Pennsylvania, about 25 miles south of Pittsburgh. And that's where I began my professional career. Uh, I ended up getting a couple of owners and I was driving in races every week. I'd have five, six, eight, ten drives. So things started to pick up and I really started to take off. I was winning races. But unfortunately, this little white powder followed me around. So so the point of the story is I, I had about a nine year career and I used cocaine not while I raced, but when I got home at night and I was able to keep it separate for a long time. But eventually it just got too tough and uh, I ended up getting out of the horse racing business. Um, I ended up I, I was in an accident, a training accident where I was severely injured. And I also was in a race where my horse had a heart attack and I was in the lead and I was run over by horses from behind. So um, at that point, I, you know, I would like to state in my defense, I never used cocaine before I raced a horse. I never drove high, but it was a matter of time until it was getting there. So I got out before it got even worse than, than it already was. So now that's about 1995. So now I'm out of the business. My, my addiction just is going strong and going on. And eventually between the marriages and having children and years go by. So now I get sober December 8th, 2017, uh, 2007 is my sobriety date. So this December, I will have 12 years sober. And uh, so I finally get sober. And 
not even thinking about horse racing, but when we come back from break, you're not going to want to miss this crazy, incredible story that happened to me and how I got back into racing. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. MJ Domit is the owner of Expect to be Empowered, a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally. After studying and making personal changes, MJ now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment. She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with accompanying empowerment cards she is a spirit book of the year gold medal living now book award winner and her book is a number one amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 gold medal winner recognized as the living now spirit book of the year an inspirational speaker mj will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life your life did not just happen to you you chose it which means you can change it visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024 Renaissance woman, trailblazer, maverick. Those are just some of the words to describe to Chandra Poulard, owner and CEO of House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC, a woman minority veteran owned entertainment company based in Washington, D.C. Ms. Poulard served 10 years honorably in the United States Navy and departed from active duty to pursue her dreams of becoming an entertainment mogul. House of Virgo Entertainment offers script writing, producing, directing, DJ services, editing, and more. They cater to businesses, corporations, college students, working professionals, aspiring artists and nonprofit organizations, and employ veterans of the armed forces. Tashandra Poulard is pioneering the way we view media and taking her brand global. Visit her at www.houseofvirgoentertainment.com or call 281-515-3740 and like her on Facebook at House of Virgo Entertainment, LLC. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And yes, indeed, I am your host, Alan Charles. I'm glad you're here. And back after commercial, before we went to break, I was telling you this. I was kind of setting up a story, uh, sharing with you my harness racing driving career and how I got into it, uh, the love that I had for the sport dating back to when I was in high school and going to a local racetrack, Yonkers Raceway, and then losing the love of harness racing because of my addiction. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty disappointing and I kind of downplayed it to myself, but that was a major force in why I was not able to continue racing. So, so I got out of racing and that's in 1995, I think was my last regular professional drive at Yonkers Raceway. So now I'm still in the middle of my addiction, and I end up uh, in, in and out of a one divorce that was uh, very quick, no children. Then I marry, uh, let's see, I get killed in a car crash and come back, um, and I can just go on and on at the craziness of my life. But then... Um, so I get married, I have children, um, and now I'm divorced, and finally I'm sober, December of 2007. So I spend that first year getting sober, very tough year, like I shared, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done. Another year goes by, so now that's now we're entering into 2009, so we're a couple of years, almost three years into to well, two years into sobriety, and I happened to reconnect with a friend of mine, Peter Kleinhans. Now, Peter, who is from New York City, 
was stable that the meadows in western Pennsylvania where I was and we were actually stabled right next to each other so you know just chatting and talking we're both from New York we both grew up going to Yonkers Raceway so it was a natural connection and we became friends and there were a group of us that hung out there and I hid my addiction but um, that is how I met Peter and when I moved to Yonkers Raceway and the Meadowlands uh, to move my career from racing in Western Pennsylvania and coming to the major leagues of harness racing, which are Yonkers Raceway and the Meadowlands, uh, actually the, the best two tracks in the entire world, uh, very fortunate to compete there. Peter would send some of his horses and for me to drive in races, and we won a bunch of races for him, and it, it was a lot of fun, and we had this great relationship. But then I just kind of disappeared, lost touch with everybody from the business, disappeared, got married, still going through addiction. And so I lost touch with Peter. So here it is, the end of 2009, and we reconnect. And we're meeting, we're, we're live really close. We're, we're like six blocks from each other. So Peter... After a few weeks of us having lunch together, he still had a stable and a very successful stable. He happened to have at the time a horse by the name of Enough Talk. Enough Talk was the fastest trotter in the world. He set a mark back then of 149 and 3 or 4, and he was the first trotter to ever go under a 150 mile. And uh, so he had a whole barn full of really good horses and asked me if I wanted to come back out and train with him. And I was like, oh, my God, I would love to. So he he said, what do you do on weekends? So the weekends that I don't have the girls, I'm free so I can help you on Saturdays. Maybe I can even come out with when I have my girls. That'll give them something to do and I can share my harness racing with them. And so I started going out and I was working weekends and I was working from my home. So Thursday mornings, I would go out really early with Peter and we would train on Thursdays and we would train on Saturdays and then we'd have go get lunch. So while I got sober, there was a race that was going on up at Monticello Raceway. And it was actually a group of races that they refer to as the heritage races. So they would have a race for during, let's say, St. Patrick's Day, and it would be for all Irish drivers. Uh, they would have a race for Italian drivers. Uh, they had a race for all around women's drivers, the Lady Godiva race. Well, they had races for Jewish drivers, and that was called the Passover pace. So I was trying to get back into wanted to race so bad. So I after I got sober, I knew about these races, and I would call up the racing, uh, the guy ahead of publicity up at Monticello Raceway, John Manzi, and I'd say, listen, John, I haven't driven in years and years and years, but I'd love to drive in the Passover pace. And for the first two years of sobriety, he would tell me, Alan, thanks, but there are so many people that want to drive in these races, and you haven't driven in, God knows, 15, 20 years. I just can't use you. It's not fair to the people that are in the business racing, so. So I understood, disappointed, and that's how each year happens. And now, here I am. I re I was training with Peter. I started driving in these qualifying races, and that was a way so the judges could see that I am capable of handling a horse. It's hard as hell to drive a 12 to 1400 pound animal and you're sitting in this this light race bike that's shaking all over the place you're out on the racetrack with seven eight nine other horses and drivers all trying to compete you have a horse pulling your lungs out and you've got inches with split second milli millimeter decisions and you've got to do this milliseconds and it's just dangerous. Your reaction time has to be great. And so they needed to make sure that I was safe. And so I drove in these races and got a bunch of races together. And the judges, after about 15 races, the judges said, Alan, you're good to go. You can drive in betting races again. So I called up John Mansey, And it was the Thursday 
before the race was going to be on Monday. But Thursday, people start putting in the entry. So I put myself in and said, John, I would call them up with the same thing third year in a row. And I said, John, I'd love to drive in the race. I have my license back. I can drive. And he said, Alan, that's great publicity-wise. It makes a great story. I'll try to use you. So Friday morning, they draw the horses in the post positions, and then they assign the driver. They assign the drivers to the horses. And I called John up, and he said, Alan, I'm really sorry. I couldn't use you. And I was so disappointed. But I woke up, and I had a premonition. My premonition was that I won the Passover pace. But how is that possible? I'm not even going to be in the race. Well, you know what? If you want to hear how that happened, stay with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And we'll be right back. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth, published by iUniverse. Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Are you stressed? Is your stress driving you crazy? Do you know there are many ways to relieve the stress? The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic does just that. Reduce your stress plus so much more. Established in 1997, the Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic offers an approach to wellness for those individuals who choose to either utilize appropriate complementary methods to enhance their current medical care or to those individuals who are on their personal journey toward improved health and wellness through the use of therapeutic bodywork, Reiki Energy Healing, or Hypnosis. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic is owned by Dr. Judy Dean, a registered nurse and board-certified massage therapist and medical hypnotherapist in LaPorte, Indiana. Visit www.spiritwithinmassage-hypnosis.com to see all services offered by Dr. Judy. For a free personal consultation, please call Dr. Judy Dean at 219-326-1380. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic, 219-326-1380. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I left you with a cliffhanger. So here I was, and we're talking about the rewards of recovery. Now, I'm sober three years, and I'm trying to get into a race that's going on up at Monticello. And it was um, for different um People. It was called the Heritage Series, so it celebrated all different nationalities, and there was a women's race, and, and all different really good things. There was eight different races, and so here they are. They're having this Passover pace. I speak to the publicity guy, John Manzi, and he unfortunately, he felt bad, and he said, Alan, I'm really sorry. I just couldn't get you in. Now... I woke up the following morning with a premonition, not that I was driving in the race, but that I won the race. And I'm like, this is insane. How is this even possible? So I sat down and started to think about it. And I have had this happen four or five times in my life where I had premonitions, saw something really clear, and then figured out how it happened. And then I let it go. And it ended up happening. So here I am. 
I decided to write a letter to John, and I thanked him for his consideration, and I appreciated it, and I understand that he wasn't able to use me, but if something happens to come up and somebody can't make it or calls in sick, that if he gives me a holler on Monday, I would be happy to come up and drive a horse for him, and that was it, so I sent that email out on Friday. So, uh, the weekend comes, and Peter calls me, and he's got a horse that's racing on Thursday, and he said, Alan, can you please do me a favor? Can you go out to the Meadowlands, train his horse Monday morning, just go a couple of trips with him, and then come back? So, I said, no problem. I'll take care of that for you. So, I get up on Monday morning, not even thinking about the race, totally forgot. Uh, Drive over from New York. I'm on the George Washington Bridge. I head to the Meadowlands. I'm there by 6.30 in the morning. I train this horse. I get done. Um, Now, I'm coming back home. It's about 8.30 in the morning. Just it's exhilarating. I was out on the racetrack jogging a horse at the Meadowlands looking at the New York skyline. It was just amazing. And I'm feeling good. And as I am on the George Washington Bridge, my phone rings. Hey, Alan, it's John Manzi. We had a guy get sick. He's got food poisoning. If you want to come up, if you can get up here, you have a drive. John I will be there. What time? What race is it? And he told me, he says, you need to be up here at 1230 and get licensed. Sure enough, I got up there in time, got licensed. And to make this story come full circle, I had the two posts. I was assigned the number two horse. I was seven to one. So I was a medium range long shot. Not a favorite. There were three or four other horses that had better odds than me. And my trainer said, why don't you just try to go to the front and see what happens? My horse is good on the lead. And I left out of there with the horse. And I don't have to tell you what happened. I went wire to the wire. And the Wynn made uh, newspapers and harness racing websites, and uh, and it was just exhilarating. Listen, we've had a great night tonight. Um, you got some of the key things that I talked about is you get yourself back, you get your family back, you get your money back, you can get your career back, and you get your dignity back. Thanks again for listening. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will see you next week. He used to be an addict, now he's substance-free, telling all about his crazy journey. This has been the Alan Charles Show with your host, Alan Charles. The views and opinions expressed by Alan Charles and guests on the Alan Charles Show are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the BBM Global Network or its affiliates. Even though Alan Charles thinks he's an expert at life, we urge you to think about acting on his advice. Even though he has been in recovery for 10 plus years, he is a bit of a Meshuggah. He's given us the real story. The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory. The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.